alright? If we've not met before, I'm Richard, um, and I've got the incredible privilege of helping us to look at the Bible together this evening. Um, so yeah, it's been a fantastic time already, isn't it? Just, um, just worshipping, just singing, um, just being amazed again. He has been so, so good to us, so, so kind to us. He has not held back from loving us. He's not held back from loving you. Um, there is nothing that he has held back in terms of pouring out his love towards you in your life. Um, no matter what you've been going through, no matter what your circumstance, um, in pouring out the life of his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross, in pouring out all of himself, God has held nothing back from you. He's held nothing back from me. Sometimes we lose sight of that, don't we? When we are in the, in the midst of something that feels difficult, of something that feels painful or challenging or maybe that disappoints us or, or feels hard and it, and it feels like maybe God feels a bit distant or maybe we've been trying to pray and, uh, and break through and it just feels like our prayers aren't being answered or, or we don't feel that closeness that we once felt. And, and then sometimes we just have to remind ourselves again, don't we? Actually, the truth is... He has held nothing back, nothing back, because if he's given his son, Jesus Christ, what more could I ask for? If he's already poured out all of himself for me, then what more proof do I need that he loves me? He has been so, so good, so, so kind I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. I couldn't earn it. There's nothing I can ever do to make myself worthy of God's love. Nothing you can ever do. You can try as hard as you like, but there's nothing you can ever do to be worthy of the most incredible love ever poured out for you. Nothing you could do to earn it or deserve it, but still he gives himself for you. So God is incredibly, incredibly generous. He gives of himself. He pours out himself. But do you know anyone, apart from God, as well as God, that's incredibly generous? Do you know any generous people? I mean, you might be really blessed to have a really rich relative or maybe a really rich friend uh, and they're doing fine, they've got no kind of money worries, they just never seem to be held back in any way and, and you know if you go out for dinner with them they're always going to be paying and you try really hard not to take it for granted but they're just so generous that after a while you just know that they're like that and that you're just going to be in for a great time because they're going to look after you and, 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 and that's great, that's fantastic, those kind of people are generous but actually they don't have to be rich do they? They don't have to be. There's something about a generous person. It's not just the amount of money, is it? Because there's some people that even though they're, they're not the really rich person that, that's just like splashing the cash everywhere, um, but yet there's something about their spirit, isn't there? Something about their heart. There's something about certain kinds of people, when you're around them, they're just great to be around because they just like don't hold themselves back from you. You know that whatever they've got, they'll share with you. You know that, you know, whether it's money, you know, whether it's time. You know, they might be like a really busy person. They might be someone who is just like, you know they're really busy. You know they're really under pressure. And yet you know that they just won't hold themselves back. That if they can give you some time, then they will because they've got a generous heart. They've got a generous spirit. You know the kind of people I'm talking about, right? And when you're around those kind of people, how do they make you feel? They make you feel great, don't they? It feels great being around generous kind of people. I mean, we won't talk about the stingy people, but the generous people, the generous people, they make you feel really good, don't they? You just like being a... It makes you feel valuable. It makes you feel valued. It makes you feel special. And they don't even have to give you loads. It's just something about that spirit. 
Well, we're going to look at that this evening. We're going to look at um, what God has to say about um, being generous. Because actually, being generous is an opportunity for us to be like God in such a way that when people are around us, they will feel valued and they will feel special and they will feel loved. And our prayer is that they will know that God values them, that God thinks that they are special and that God loves them because we want to make Jesus famous, right? I just like giving away my whole message. That's it. So we'll just look at it in the Word of God and prove that what I just told you is true, okay? So 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and from verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 from verse 6 to 15. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you've proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace that God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Well, there's loads in here, loads for us um, to unpack in this passage. Um, So we're just going to take it a few verses at a time. But first of all, just to look at the context. Paul has just spent the whole of chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians, as well as the first five verses before we got to the bit I was reading from, um, leading up to this passage. There's a whole lot of context. And in fact, actually, the story starts much earlier than that. It actually starts back in the first letter to the Corinthians, where Paul told the Corinthians about a plan he had to help the Christians in Jerusalem. Now, the church in Jerusalem, the people in Jerusalem, were going through a hard time. They'd fallen on hard times. And so Paul came up with this idea that actually I'll write letters to some of the other churches and get them to help the Christians that are going through a difficult time. And actually, Paul came up with this idea in general that rather than having to take a special offering every time there was a need, kind of working out that Actually, do you know what? It takes money to make things happen amongst God's people. That there's always going to be things that we need to spend money on together. So Paul came up with the idea and he said, actually, what would be really great is if at the start of every week, you actually put some of money aside. You took basically money together as a church and you put it aside so that actually we wouldn't have to have a special offering every time any single need arises. Okay, So that's where we get the idea of taking up our tithes and our offerings and, and having money together that we've put together to be able to use for the needs that arise within the church, what we're doing together, meeting the needs of people in the community and all those kind of things. So Paul's been teaching them all about this, but he's he's coming to them and he's saying there is a special need um, in Jerusalem. And and then in chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians, he gives the example of one particular church in Macedonia. Now this church in Macedonia, he gives us an example because he says actually they are not very well off at all. And I... The impression he gives is that it probably was going to leave that church out of taking up the offering. Because I'll read you what he says about them um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. He says, And now, brothers and sisters, 
We want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. Now think about it for a moment. That's amazing. Here was a church that Paul says were in extreme poverty. So if anyone had an excuse to pass the basket by and hope that no one would notice, it was the Macedonians. Because they were really hard up. They had a genuine reason. No one would have minded. No one would have judged them. I know we're always a little bit conscious about that, aren't they? What will people think? Well, you know, it's a bit awkward if, like, someone's looking your way just as you get past the basket, isn't it? It's just like, you know, just like trying to distract them. Um, But the Macedonians, no one would have minded. No one would have judged them because they were in a really tough situation. Um, But they were like, no, don't leave us out. Don't leave us out of the opportunity to be part of God's generosity. And it says that their extreme poverty and their overflowing joy, it was like it got mixed up. And what was the result? If you put the ingredients of extreme poverty and overflowing joy together in a cake, what's the result? It welled up in amazing generosity. Isn't that amazing? Their joy was enough that when it was combined with their poverty, even though they were poor, it still looked like generosity. Now, I imagine that their generosity probably still couldn't have looked the same amount of money as one of the richer churches, but it What was beautiful about it was the generous spirit, the generous heart. So much so that Paul talks about the grace that was upon them. The grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Now think about grace for a moment. What is grace? How do we try and describe grace? We often think about grace in terms of how God gives us what we don't deserve. God's grace towards us, how he blesses us, how he draws us into his relationship with him. We've sung about it. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Yet you give yourself away. The grace of God. The grace of God poured out in our lives enables us to do what we never could have done on our own, what we couldn't have earned, what we couldn't have worked up. So what Paul is saying here is that there's a grace on these Macedonians that they're able to go beyond what is normal, what is humanly possible, what anyone would have expected of them in their own humanity, in their own strength. There's a grace of God. Actually, we sometimes refer to gifts of the Spirit as the grace gifts because the word, in fact, we use the word charismatic to talk about people who believe in the gifts of the Spirit. Well, that word charismatic comes from grace, charisma, charis, grace. They're grace gifts. And actually, generosity is a gift of God's grace. And so if you turn with me to Romans chapter 12, verses 6 to 8, It says this, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Wow, so... Giving and generosity is actually a grace gift of God. Now, before we all get too excited and say, that's brilliant, because actually, I think my gift is leading, so I don't have to be generous. Actually, I'm not sure you could say, well, I don't have to be merciful, or I don't have to encourage people. So yes, Paul is recognizing that there are certain kind of measures of grace that are on different ones of us. So we all know certain people are just like mega great, awesome encouragers, don't we? Yet some people, they just like... God just put them on this planet to encourage people because they're so, so good at it. But that doesn't mean that I'm off the hook, does it? 
That doesn't mean that I don't have to encourage people and that I can be really discouraging to whoever I want because I can just say, no, it's okay, go and see Josh, he's the encourager. <laughs> no, I've still got to be encouraging. There might be a, a greater dimension of grace upon another person's life. We've all got to be generous and it's a work of the Spirit in our lives, which is amazing because we were all singing tonight and we were crying out to God and we're saying, God, make me more like you. Change me. Come, Holy Spirit. Come and work in my life. Let your grace work in my life and make me more like you. Something that I couldn't have made happen in and of myself. But you didn't hold yourself back from me. You've been so, so kind to me. And you pour out your Holy Spirit. We sang, Holy Spirit, you've, I've made your, your, my heart home for you. Come and change me. Come and make me more like you, Lord. So, I think we better get back to our passage. 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 6. We'll start there. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. giver. Now, sowing and reaping is a principle that's repeated again and again and again in our Bibles. Sometimes explicitly with those words, talking about sowing and reaping, because it was a very kind of agricultural kind of culture, so people really would have understood. I mean, it's not so much these days, is it? We don't really, most of us aren't going to be farmers, but in those days, most people would have really got this. Um, and so it was a, a principle, that, that, an illustration that God used again and again and again to help his people understand a principle of life. Okay? So sometimes Jesus used different words. So he'd say things like, you know, actually, do you know what? If you're going to be judging people, then the same way you judge other people is the way that you're going to be judged. Yeah? So Jesus was saying, if you sow a whole load of judgment into your garden... Don't be surprised when the crop that you grow is judgment in your life. Yeah? Does that make sense? So, um, you know, it was like if you judge people harshly, you'll be judged harshly. Or um, the scripture says that if you pursue the things of this world, if you sow to the flesh, if you sow to, to, to those desires in you that are not godly desires, then you are going to reap in your garden a whole load of brokenness. You're going to reap the brokenness. If you sow to this world and not the things of God, then you'll reap the things, the brokenness of this world and not the things of God. If you give yourself to God's kingdom, if you sow towards God's kingdom in your life, this is, you know, in, what, in your actions, in your thoughts, in just what you give yourself to. If you, if you sow into your garden things to do with God's kingdom and God's righteousness, you're going to reap those things in your garden. Now, some Christians have gone a little bit wrong with this principle because they got a little bit confused along the way and somehow they got into their heads. If I sow lots of really good things, then I will reap lots of worldly things for me to enjoy. I don't know where we got this idea from because the Bible's quite clear about it. It says, what you sow is what you will reap. So, sow to the Spirit, sow for justice and righteousness. What are you excited about seeing grow in your garden? Justice and righteousness. So, you give your life to helping the poor, to, to reaching out to the marginalized and the oppressed. What excites you? Oh, I'm going to get a Mercedes! No! No, 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 no. No, you weren't sowing for Mercedes. You were sowing what you were excited about, remember, was justice and righteousness because you didn't want people to be poor and oppressed anymore. So the thing that excites you more than a Mercedes is when people aren't poor and oppressed anymore. Does that make sense? In fact, the Bible says, don't be deceived. God can't be mocked. You can't make an idiot out of God. You can't pull one over on him, go, ha, ha, I'm going to sow to like, justice and righteousness and get myself a new watch. <laughs> no, you can't do that because God knows your heart. And if actually you're just chasing material things, then, then you're not actually sowing to the Spirit, are you? 
So God says, so to what really matters. Now, Paul says each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. So he's not saying, like, you've got to do this sowing and reaping thing because I'll whip you if you don't. He's saying, I want you to understand this sowing and reaping thing. I want you to understand how it works because I want you to reap the benefits of it in your life. And the benefits of this sowing and reaping thing is going to be that you're going to become a more generous people. Not you're going to become a more self-absorbed, self-obsessed, chasing after the things of this world kind of people, but you're going to become a more godly kind of people. You're going to become the kind of people that are going to bring glory and honor to Jesus. Now we're going to get to that. But you see, some Christians have really struggled with the whole thing of tithes and offerings. Because all the stuff about tithing, well not all of it, but most of the stuff about tithing, we get from the Old Testament. So we learn from the Old Testament how God's people used to bring 10% of everything, of all their crops, of, every, of their income, if you like, but of, of what they have. They'd bring 10% and they'd and they give it for the work of God through his people. And they'd bring offerings on top of that. And so, but some people have said, well, hang on a minute, we don't live under the Old Covenant anymore. So actually, you know, we're free now. So actually, because we're free, we can be stingy. See, that's where it breaks down, isn't it? Because it doesn't quite compute that, does it? Like, the, the new covenant, it's true, we are under a new and a better covenant. But that's the thing. The new covenant is a better covenant. So, for example, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus was trying to help the religious leaders understand that actually they had all these rules about, like, you weren't allowed to call people a certain name. And, and Jesus said, yeah, yeah, but you've got to understand I've come to actually fulfill all of that law. So not only now should you still not call that person that name, but you shouldn't even think it in your head. And he said, no, you know, it's not only that you shouldn't commit adultery, but that you shouldn't fantasize about committing adultery in your head, because if you've done it in your head, then it's just as bad. So what Jesus was saying is not, I've come to let you off all of those rules. What Jesus was saying was actually, I've come to offer you something far better than all of those rules. Because those rules you never kept. And you weren't able to live the way God wanted you to live. But I've come to set you free, but set you free not so that you can now go and break all the rules. I've come to set you free so that you are actually more righteous than the rules could ever have made you in the first place. So... In this new covenant where we're free and where we've got the Holy Spirit and he enables us to be more like God, more like Jesus than the law could ever have possibly managed, do you think we'll look like more generous or less generous people? We're going to look more generous, aren't we? So that's my problem with when people say, well, well, you know, actually, you've got to understand that we're not under law and, and we're under grace and we're under the Spirit. Yeah, fine, but why is it that everyone that gives me that argument wants to put less in the offering rather than more? Surely the Spirit makes us more generous. But what Paul's saying is, I'm not, I'm not going to twist your arm. I'm not going to control you. I'm not going to watch when the basket comes by or when you're typing on your phone on your internet bank. I'm not going to be like having a sneaky glance to see what you're typing in because it's not about me controlling you. I'm appealing to you. Now, why is Paul appealing to them? Well, let's carry on reading from verse 8. God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Now notice what he says there. He says, you'll have everything that you need and you will abound in, what will you abide in? What abound in? Good works. Good works. So for you, you'll have what you need, but what you'll abound in is good works. Yeah? So it's really clear, isn't it? That's what Paul says. He says, God loves a cheerful giver. Why does God love a cheerful giver? Well, God loves a cheerful giver because he loves it when you're like him. 
He loves it when you're like him. He's your father. He's your father. And when you're like him, he just loves it. It's not like God doesn't love anyone. Okay? It's not like, you know, the, the stingy givers, God's like, I hate him. No, because God loves everyone. God loves everyone. But he loves it when he sees you being a cheerful giver. Because he goes, wow, that's my girl. That's my boy. It's being just like me in that moment. Just look at that. It's allowing me to work in his heart, in her heart, by the Holy Spirit. And changing and making a generous heart. And he says, I'm going to bless that. I'm going to bless that. And not only am I going to make sure that you've got everything that you need, because that's my promise to you, that you'll have everything that you need. My promise to you is that you'll have everything that you need. But also, not only are you going to have everything you need, it's not just going to look like need, it's going to look like overflowing. But overflowing in what? In good works. You have everything you need because God knows that you need food and God knows that you need clothes. God knows that you need shelter. So you're going to have everything that you need, but I promise you, you're going to abound in good works. And so he goes on. They freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Not like they had to measure them out. Not like they had to really ration what they were able to do for the poor. But they freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. So what's he saying? He's saying he gives seed to sow and bread to eat. Okay? God gives you seed to sow and bread to eat. So you have in your life from God some seed to sow and some bread to eat. And so the big challenge for all of us is to work out which is which. Yeah? To work out, God, what have you given me to eat? Because actually, you're not going to be a great blessing to the church if you're so generous that you give away all your rent, all your food, all your gas and electric bill money, and actually you come turning up here tomorrow morning and say, I put it all in the offering. Can I have some of it back, please? Um, you know, obviously, there's grace, and we want to help. And, but it's, not, it's just not the best way of doing it, is it? If you've put everything that you were supposed to give to your landlord into the offering, then you're going to have a problem when the landlord comes knocking at the door. And they're probably not going to be happy with, oh, I gave it all in the offering at church. So we've got to work out, what has God given me as bread to eat, and what has God given me as seed to sow? But the challenge for all of us is not to scoff the seed that God gave us to sow. Is that right? The challenge is to work out, what has God given me to sow? Why? Because it's when we sow that we're able, and this is the genius of, of, of the way God works, and it's really simple when you get the kind of like farming thing, that if we don't sow some of our seed, then we're not going to get more crop. So God says, you sow your seed so that you can reap more seed. Why? So that you can go on being generous. So the heart behind all of this sowing and reaping things that some people got scared of because they thought it was like the prosperity gospel or whatever. Yes, it's prosperity, but prosperity in the sense of overflowing in good works. Overflowing in generosity. Being able to bless God's people. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to enjoy the blessings that God gives you in life. I'm not saying God won't pour out and give good things for you to enjoy because he loves you. And he loves to pour out good gifts and do good things in our life. So don't get into a poverty mentality that says, I'm not allowed to enjoy anything. God gives bread to eat. But I'm saying the point, the heart behind it needs to be, God wants me to abound in good works so that I can be generous on every occasion. And why? Why does God want me to be generous? You'll be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Because when you're generous, the idea is people look at you and they see something of God at work in your life. Verse 12, this service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. 
Because of the service by which you've proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and everyone else. Your generosity is part of the gospel. Isn't that amazing? Your generosity, my generosity, is part of the gospel. It's proof that God is able to transform our lives so that we stop being people that are centered on ourselves, pursuing all of our needs, that the whole world revolves around me, that actually that it is possible to be set free from that. So that actually our world revolves around God, around Jesus, and around his incredible love. And people start to experience that when they come into contact with us. They start to encounter a person who's so in love with God, who's so in love with Jesus, that actually they're not holding everything back for themselves. And that when you meet them, and when you encounter their need, when you come into their life, then your heart is moved by them and their situation. And your heart starts to pour out towards them Because God's at work in you, and you're loving them with the love of God. And so your obedience to God and to being generous actually overflows and starts to touch their life. Because of this service by which you proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace that God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. The whole point is that people will see our generosity, whether it's our giving to the church, whether it's our faithfully bringing our tithes and our offerings, whether it's our generosity towards people around us in the church, whether it's our generosity to people outside of the church, the people that we meet in our workplaces, in our communities. It's that heart of generosity that you can't fake, that you can't just put it on on a Sunday meeting by the amount that you put in an offering, but it actually touches our whole life. It's something that the Holy Spirit, that grace of God, gets hold of us and transforms us. And that generosity, that generous spirit, will start to touch the lives of people around us. And it becomes part of our gospel. It becomes part of our message. It makes Jesus famous. That people start to say, wow, that's a life that looks different. What is it about your life? In asking us to be generous... God is just asking us to be like him. He's just saying, I want to send you into this world in the same way that the Father sent Jesus so that when people looked at Jesus, they saw God. They saw everything that was amazing and fantastic and wonderful about God. And Jesus simply says to us tonight, I want to send you. I want to send you into your workplace, into your university, into your you know, neighborhood, into your family. And I want everything that's true about me to be on display. And so in this particular case, I want my generosity to be on display in your life because I want people to see my generosity in you. So I want to challenge us this evening. Would we be inspired again by the generosity of God himself, by his indescribable gift? He's been so, so good to us. He's been so, so kind to us. And would we allow Holy Spirit to move in our hearts and to make us generous in every way, in our giving in the church, in our giving to one another, in our giving beyond the church, in just a heart, whether it's finance, whether it's time, that a heart is generous. Oh, Holy Spirit, produce a generous heart in me that my generous heart would truly point people towards you and result in many expressions of thanks and praise to you. Use our generosity, Lord, to make Jesus truly famous. Amen. Amen.